Good afternoon and welcome. It's great to see so many attendees here for what I promise will be a great session, uh, both in terms of the content we will be discussing and, of course, the great panel we have. We also have the Global Shaper community with us. Uh, my name is Mina al -Arabi. I'm the Assistant Editor-in-Chief of Al-Sharq al awsat newspaper based in London. I'm an Iraqi, and these issues are very close to my heart. Concerns about religious intolerance, extremism, violence, misunderstanding, how do we live together in a world that seems to be getting smaller in some ways, but also much more divided than other times. Whether it's in France or Syria, the Central African Republic, Myanmar, so many other examples of religious intolerance on some hand, extremism on the others. So what we're going to try to discuss in the next hour and a half with your input, with your questions, and please questions, not comments, since we are short on time, um, is how can we rid religion of the stigma of being associated with a pretext for conflict? Because I think myself and those of us here on the panel don't believe that religion in terms of faith and religion is the pretext for conflict, but what is it that's making it so stigmatized today? I'm going to introduce our panel here, and then we will take a few moments to have a discussion with the panel and then open it up for your questions. Um, I have here Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen, who's president of Zaytuna College in the US. And I have Archbishop Ferbo Cecile Magoba, who's Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Anglican Church of South Africa. Rabbi David Rosen, Rabbi International Director, Interreligious Affairs of the American Jewish Committee in Israel. And we have Tony Blair, who's Middle East Quartet Representative and my former Prime Minister in London. <laughs> Okay, and we are also going to have Global Shaper Hubs who are going to be dialing in with us. They've spent quite some time discussing this particular issue. We have dialing in from Iraq, the city of Erbil, from Jordan, the city of Amman, from Germany, the city of Frankfurt, and from Canada, the city of Toronto. So you'll have an opportunity to hear from them also, their input, and the discussions that younger people are also having about these issues. But I'll start first with Sheikh Hamza. This problem is not new. We were just discussing it. It's been maybe as long as humans have had faiths and beliefs and fought for them and believed that they were defending them and sometimes. And other times, it's been the cause of wars and divisions. But for some people, it feels like it's reached an unprecedented level, at least in our lifetimes. We can't deny it. There are Muslims who are killing and saying that they are killing in the name of Islam. So how do you respond to that? And how do we bring back the religion from the crimes that are being committed in its name? Right. Well, Bismillah, uh, as you said, I mean, it's not a new thing. Uh, one of the things about uh, our civilization is, is we have a kind of political creation myth uh, of the nation state that argues that um, the nation state emerged, uh, the, the ideological nation state emerged out of an attempt to become a, a, an arbiter, a peacemaker between these religious sectarian, sectarianism. So in, in that creation myth, it basically states that during the 16th and 17th century, you had these wars of religion. That's what they're called. And so the nation state emerges out of that and, and kind of creates peace and a secular society that enables religions to live together uh, under the protection of a, a secular state. If, if you read William Kavanaugh's book, The Myth of Religious Violence, I think he makes a very strong historian's argument. And he argues in there that political scientists uh, rarely admit this fact, but historians do, that religion does not play the central role in, these, in the violence. In fact, in the religious wars of the 16th and 17th century, uh, you had periods where the the Catholics were fighting Catholics, and you, you have periods where the, 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 the Catholics actually allied with the Lutherans against other Catholics. So this, this kind of idea that it's always about religion is false, and what he argues is much of it is about uh, the socioeconomic and political scenarios. And uh, religion is, is enlisted in that, and I think what's happened in the Middle East um, you know, if you look at the 20th century, the, the Muslims were, probably Marxism played a more uh, important role uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 20th century 
in, in the Middle East in terms of its attempts to rid itself from the yoke of colonialism and these things. But a lot of these Marxists, and, and lest less us you know, forget that the Palestinians were, it, it was all Marxist movements you know, that transitioned into the Islamist um, uh, approach to dealing with these problems. So I, I think that uh, it's important that we see that religion historically is enlisted in, in, in violence that's much more uh, to do with uh, the socio-political and economic problems of a region. And I think uh, for, for right now, the Muslims, we have a serious crisis because what's happened is uh, what, what I would call traditional Islam, and I think people uh, you know, who understand the history of Islam will note that the Muslims have been one of the exceptional religious civilizations that enabled other religions to live peacefully amongst them. I mean, this is simply a fact. The Ottomans uh, had a uh, multicultural civilization, and, and this was part of their uh, understanding, that they were there to protect these other religions. They called them Vimyun, and there's a lot of attacks on the idea of Vimmatud, but the meaning of Vimma was the protected group, and, and, and they really saw it. And this is why you still have churches uh, in, in, in th they're being destroyed by these people that really are, this is a perversion of Islam. It's, it's not Islam, it's a perversion of Islam. And, um, and, and so the Muslims, those of us who, who you know, really are committed to this traditional Islam, uh, you know, we're in a crisis situation. Um, and, and undeniably, uh, Islam is increasingly being portrayed as this monolithic monster that's threatening to gobble up the West, uh, which I think is absurd. I mean, I think uh, Nazi Germany was, w w the comparison is odious, um, or even to the fascists who, I mean, their technology, their organization, the Muslims can't get trains to run on time like Mussolini. Fair point, but I think there is there is a question about the role of religious leaders in saying yes. While we can bring up very important examples of the history of religion actually allowing people to coexist and and faith bringing people together, the reality is there has been some failure to some degree by religious leaders in trying to take away religion from those extremists who will kill in the name of religion. And perhaps what's different from other historical um, examples is that it's not countries or heads of state that are using religion as a tool, rather these non-state actors that are really using religion to foster extremists and intolerance. So I'd like to ask you, Archbishop Dabo, is it a crisis of leadership amongst religious leaders that's also contributed to this phenomenon? Well, well, thank you for your question. Um, perhaps let me start by saying religion is about belonging. And um, the religious leaders have used that sense of needing to belong uh, positively, uh, sometimes not so positively. But uh, if one were to say religious leaders have failed uh, in their, by, their, by themselves, I think that's part of, of the answer. Uh, and as somebody said, uh, religious is a reality. It is a spiritual reality and a sociological reality. And if religion is a spiritual and a sociological reality, as the previous speaker said, then it takes uh, those that perhaps may n put themselves in a smaller corner of saying we are spiritual leaders and those that we are sociological uh, leaders. But one thing I know is religion does play a very powerful tool in social, uh, social cohesion. And social cohesion does not take uh, a number of dogmatic statements uh, to, to happen. It takes the courage of religious leaders to say, if there is corruption amongst themselves, if there is abuse of power by those that have been put to be in charge of nation states or the sociological well-being of, of, of people, they need to speak up and speak out. And uh, so that begs the question that why do people use uh, uh, religion as a pretext uh, uh, for conflict? 
Of course, uh, people have realized the, that human beings are all fallible human beings, whether you are a religious human being or not. And if you are fallible and somebody has equated your religious belief to your sense of security, they can manipulate you at any time because they know that you will fear losing your, your security, you'll fear losing your power. And if that is couched in religious terms, uh, then you are able to manipulate people. And so I want to say, yes, I'm the first one to admit that we may have failed. But I want to throw the challenge that we have failed together. And it takes all of us to say, what is religion? If this religion is a spiritual reality and a sociological reality, what are we doing as a collective to ensure that we are not manipulated in this, in this instance by those in political leadership? Thank you. Manipulation is a big part of politics. And Rabbi David, I wanted to ask you about the issue that many of these conflicts that are given a religious cloak are really political at heart. Um, whether we look at the Middle East or we look at many other parts of the world. So why is religion so easily manipulated? Is it just a sense of a belonging or is there a weakness in the political systems we have that allows religion to be used in this way? I think that's the million dollar question. And um, I don't think there's a cookie cutter here. I don't think any one answer can be satisfactory. Uh, the, I've lived through examples of where you've seen the good and the bad of religion. Um, I, my first role was in Archbishop Tabo City. I was rabbi of the largest Orthodox Jewish congregation in Cape Town, it was actually at the world at the time, and South Africa, and in the end the government had enough of me and sent me packing, but South Africa was a classic example of where religion was both the problem and the solution, but not the origin of the conflict, which was racial persecution and the disenfranchisement of the majority. But religion was used by certain elements to bolster up oppression and to justify minority control. It was also the force that supported and nurtured the amazing liberation forces that brought about the new South Africa. So you see the good and the bad. After they got rid of me in South Africa, I was chief rabbi of Ireland. Ireland's a classic example of the abuse of religion, and not just on the part of non-conventional components, but on the part of the establishments, where it was abused on all parties. And yet, when the reconstruction of Ireland, the changes take place, that of course, Tony Blair can take a lot of credit for, you've seen the enormously constructive role that religion can and must play. In fact, in both places, things improved generally when I left, so there's now a move to get me out of Jerusalem. <laughs> Maybe if they get me out of Jerusalem, things will improve in the Middle East it's as great. well. great. We've solved Middle East <laughs> peace right here on stage. <laughs> but I really think it has a lot to do with what Tabo just mentioned. I mean, religions have been described as made up of the three Bs, mm. belief, behavior, and belonging. And it varies from place to place. Religion is not the same thing from one context to another, even within one religious tradition itself. But because it is wrapped up with belonging, with identity, when identity is threatened, we turn to religion to nurture it. If you look at the prophets of Israel, our ancient biblical prophets, they're doing one of two things. They're either challenging the people and saying, you've got to realize that you, but just because you feel a special presence of the divine in your history, that doesn't give you any entitlement. You're no different from anybody else. Every human being has to be just and righteous. That goes for everyone without exception. And the other time the prophets are saying, don't worry, God loves you, he'll bring you back, everything will be okay. The latter is being said to the people when they're vulnerable. The former is being said to the people when they are actually secure. So religion both challenges us to live up to our highest, most noble principles, but it also provides succor, support, nourishment, sustenance, comfort in times of trouble. And when we feel threatened in any way whatsoever, it's natural and desirable to turn to religion to be able to find that support. The danger is that because religion relates to identity, identity not only tells me who I am, it also tells me who I am not. 
And in turning to religion to support me as, if you like, the righteous suffering, there is the danger that I will portray those who are opposed to me as the devilish tools of diabolical forces. And that's where religion can get so terribly subverted, in which this identity manipulation of belonging and of the nurture from religious commitment can become a tool for the most catastrophic actions in which people really believe that they're doing what God wants them to do, that they're really doing something that's good for their religion, when in fact they are not only a threat to everyone around them, but they are the biggest threat to their own religious tradition and heritage themselves. So... <laughs> This is what religion does, it brings out passions. Um, and it's good to see that passion, but all of, all of what you said is also based on how much you know of your own religion and the religion of others. And many of us um, who are religious know of our religion, what our parents have taught us, or whether we've been to certain schooling, and that can really influence how you view religion. Um, Mr. Blair, I want to turn to you at this point and ask you about that issue of education. You've spoken quite a bit about education would help fight extremism. But at the same time, what sort of education? And also, do we have the time to re-educate ourselves or re-educate others at a time when, when there are hot spots burning? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the, the panel. And I think the first thing to say is that Extremism is not new. Um, we, we had extremism in the 20th century through communism, through fascism, um, both of which were ideologies that were profoundly anti-religious. Don't forget colonialism. Thank you. <laughs> that, you're, just, you're just reminding the British of that. Yeah? <laughs> um, just my um, yes, blood. of course, and colonialism too. Um, actually, one of the things you find being uh, former British Prime Minister is wherever you go in the world, at some point someone says, oh yeah, it was all the fault of the British, they were there. <laughs> um, but I, I, so I begin from the proposition that it's not religion per se that is the cause of conflict because you can get causes of conflict that are completely anti-religious. However, today, the ideology that is most threatening our security and our stability is an ideology based on a perversion of religion. And you know, for me, the, the way the world works today is very simple. And you can see this even at a very elite level at the World Economic Forum. The world today works by connectivity, right? It works by people across boundaries of nation and race um, and faith coming together, working together, um, being in community with each other. And that world, both economically, socially, politically, which is more interconnected than ever before, it only works if people have a sense of minimally tolerance and preferably respect towards people who are different. So you've got Jews, Christians, and Muslims on this panel here today. You know, if we can get on together and respect each other, see our diversity as a strength, the world will work better, right? This is all obvious and clear. So, the question to my mind is this, because when, when you have these, uh, these acts of terrorism, you've got um, whole parts of um, countries being destabilized at the moment, there are a certain number of security issues that arise from that and measures that you've got to take for security. But at the heart of this, you've got to defeat the ideology based on a perversion of religion. And for that, the reason I say education is a security issue is that I think we've got to be very clear about this. In our world today, in our own countries, but throughout the world, there are young people educated in formal and informal education systems that are educated not to an open-minded view of the world, but to a closed-minded view, to a view which, as the rabbis just said, takes identity and makes identity of religion a cause for intolerance but against those who don't share that identity, even, by the way, when they're within your own faith. So in order, to, in order to get to the roots of this, 
because security measures only have a limited application ultimately, you've got to go to those education systems. And one of the things that, that I am arguing for with my foundation at the moment is that we need a, a global compact on education, which world leaders sign up to and take as a responsibility of their governments in their countries, that we will ensure in our education systems that young people are educated towards religious tolerance and respect and against religious prejudice. And we need to make, you know, this should be a, an obligation of governments that's as important as any obligation, for example, in relation to the environment or what you do in respect of the money laundering or the global economy. We need to make sure we go to the heart of this issue, which is this extremism is not natural, it's taught and it's learned. And you have to unteach it and unlearn it in the school systems that are creating it. But the school systems are not in a vacuum. And the children that are being taught this intolerance are not being taught in a vacuum where they're living in stable, good countries. And if only we could change the education system, they would be more accepting. Unfortunately, many of these countries have gone through war, have felt that they are oppressed not only internally, but from the outside. And so to many degrees, conflicts that were never religious, as we were saying earlier, become religious because people turn to that as a sense of belonging. And I, I, I take what you're saying about education, but I think many people would push back and say, that alone will never work, because unless those same governments that are committing to a compact of education have to commit to stop of bombardment and course. to stop uh, persecution of different groups. So I guess politically, we'll also it stays as much larger budgets for military hardware than they do for education, which is the case in all of the Muslim countries. That's true. I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer, Mr. Mayor. I think this is really important because, of course, in all of these situations, you've got political dimensions, you've got often very weak institutions, you've got challenges of governance, but I don't think you can put to one side this issue that the extremism we see is based on a perversion of religion mm -hmm. and that religious perversion is being promulgated and taught. So. I, if people say to me, well, that's not enough, I completely agree. If they say it's not important, I completely disagree. It is fundamentally important, but of course it needs to go alongside other things as well, most notably in respect of governance. But, you know, we've got to be clear about this. There are millions of young people taught every day, not about the great possibilities of integration and getting on with other people, but a one-sided view of the world. And, you know, look, I remember growing up in a northern part of the UK where everyone was the same, right? I, re I actually remember the day I met my first non-white person. I was 12 years old, right? That was the community I grew up in. But my 14-year-old today, at his birthday party, he will have every type of ethnicity and at least three or four faces sitting around that table. That's the way the world is today. But in order for it to work, that young person has got to be open-minded to the person that's different. And that is in part, not exclusively, but in part about education. May, may I add something? Sure. Uh, and, and just to affirm what's been said, but to state the obvious, which perhaps hasn't been articulated. Uh, there are a number of different issues that have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Education is a critical one. But obviously, it's not the problem here is not just a matter of a fundamentalist worldview. Not every fundamentalist that some of us might designate as ideologically extremist is necessarily a physical threat. Examples proliferate. You have, even within certain Sufi traditions, certain, if you like, very um, insular perceptions within the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. There are elements whose worldview would be very uh, much opposed to most of ours, but who do not pose a physical threat. You have the Amish, uh, the Amish in, in America. There are many fundamentalist groups who are not because of their fundamentalism or their insular world view a threat in themselves. There has to be a combination here. There has to be the combination of an insular mentality together with the socio-political and economic conditions that can nurture it. And that's not just doesn't mean impoverishment and alienation, political and economic, which obviously is the swamp that facilitates these uh, uh, perversions. But there's also the psychological dimension that I think Sheikh Hamza alluded to. And it's important to bear in mind because the perpetrators of 9-11 were not uneducated people. Many of these, and certainly Osama bin Laden wasn't an uneducated person. There is the place 
paradoxically, precisely of people more exposed to the more developed, more sophisticated world that they encounter, where they feel they are not respected, they are humiliated, they are disregarded, and they are seen as somehow, in their own mind, part of historic victimhood. Now, that's the real danger where that interface all plays in together. And that's, I believe, why the work of all of us who are involved in interfaith relations is so important. We have to reach out, and it's not just those of us involved in interfaith relations. It's all those involved in multi-social, cultural, ethnic, diverse activities. The more people feel welcome within society, the more they have a stake in it. The less they feel have something to live for, the more readily and easily they will see there's something to die for. Okay, well, the conversation could continue to go on, but I, I want to bring in one of the hubs, if you'll allow me, but Archbishop Thabo, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you and then I'll turn to the hubs, please. Uh, I, I, th I think the fundamental question is um, to start at the heart of the matter. If we ignore where we come from and think we could just start somewhere and move on, we will uh, likely to fail. Let me, let me just situate uh, the statement uh, in my context. If we, and I'm not justifying uh, religious conflict, it's wrong. Uh, I'm not, I need to condemn um, what happened uh, uh, in France. But I want to pose the question of, that was posed to the Pope. Is uh, freedom of expression without limits. And his answer was definitely it does have limits. So if we know that religion has got a welter of emotion associated to it, and we go all out of our way to provoke that which people hold so dearly and passionately, what response do we want? If we allow, uh, really, a hypothetical situation, but it's real, people to still come and, within the extractive industry, mine the precious platinum and take it away and leave certain communities worse off. And the only mobilizing force is Religion can make us belong and have an identity to oppose this power that is foreign. What do we, do we think educational intervention or just preaching from the pulpit will help? I think I'm at pains to say we need to go down and look at the source of extremism and try to uproot them look at the political causes of extremism and try and deal with those. Thank you. I'm going to turn to the first of four hubs who are with us. Um, this is the Global Shapers Hub, one of two communities for young people that the, young, uh, the World Economic Forum um, has really developed and brought together. One is the Young Global Leaders, which I'm proud to be part of, and the Global Shapers. The Global Shapers in Erbil, in Iraq, have asked Professor Dilawar al din who's president of the Middle East Research Institute, to bring their point of view across to us. So he's unfortunately no one of the Global Shapers, but he's quite close to them and has been um, speaking about this particular topic with them. Uh, Professor, please, if you can come in. Thank you very much. I've been enjoying this. Uh, you're right, I'm not one of the young uh, shapers, uh, but I'm young at heart. Um, from um, Really, I've, I've been enjoying this debate, but when, from where I am uh, in the Middle East, uh, we do see uh, different, uh, all the religions, especially the dominant ones, the Islamic religion especially, is indeed uh, subject to selective and narrow interpretations by different groups. And we are seeing the consequences of that, but we also see the consequences of lack of sufficient attention and investment in the process of governance and state building and nation building in this region. Uh, in, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, where we are at the moment, uh, we can see that the whole region is descending uh, to dark ages. 
uh, with the several dysfunctional or even failed states uh, crumbling. And if left alone, um, even more states will be consumed by it. Now, the, the void that has been created is clearly uh, filled by uh, barbarian uh, interpretation of Islam and, uh, and the, really the acute problems um, uh, here in the Middle East are completely different from the rest of the globe where long-term projects like uh, promoting tolerance and education and all that, they are fine for the long-term solution of this chronic problem. But actually what we face here are the acute issues that are existential for many of the minority religions and for uh, communities that have been uprooted. The, uh, the roots of uh, Islamic uh, extremism in Iraq and Syria, for instance, really stem from the social and economic uh, deprivation and the and lack of serious investment in, in nation building and state building, lack of rule of law, social justice. Now, interestingly, there are local, regional stakeholders and international ones. Uh, and, and these days there are state and non-state uh, actors. Uh, all of these are part of the problem as well as part of the solution. Now, the uh, local uh, stakeholders have been really filling the void uh, after the, the major powers have uh, kept a distance from this region. And uh, this is what we see how the chaos is, is now prevailing. But the international stakeholders specifically, the superpowers, have over the decades established good relations with the elite within the Islamic countries. And uh, that is at the expenses of the rest of the communities and the grassroots uh, uh, public. So the balance power now in the new Middle East is changing uh, with, with much greater need for really finding headways into uh, guaranteed uh, social, uh, political, and economic developments. Now, I come back to the point that we are at the moment uh, invariably dealing with consequences, with uh, long-term solutions, but what we need uh, uh, in the Middle East are uh, short-term and intermediate-term solutions, and that, that is really relating to right. nation-building and uh, uh, addressing the, uh, the, the way that the extreme, extreme interpretations of Islam have found fert uh, fertile ground in these deprived communities, in the uh, sidelined communities, and, and suddenly they're embedded, integrated, uh, uh, and it's actually wrong to see the current war against ISIS as a, as a problem of extreme religion or problem between uh, 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 Salafism, extreme Salafism and the rest of Islam. Uh, the, 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 the violence, the, the behaviors, and the uh, uh, overall uh, trend of descending into more violence is, is only now becoming visible to the outside world, but it has always been there. Ten years ago, there was a, a civil war in Iraq with uh, people killing each other in the same manner in the, in, under the name of uh, Sunni Shi or sectarianism. Fifty years ago, the king of Iraq was slaughtered and, and, and there was coup d'etat and then uh, rivers of blood never non-stop, uh, all under pretext of religious differences and, and goes Professor, back a long time to centuries. Forgive me, especially if we go down the history of Iraq and conflict, unfortunately, we'll be here a long time. Thank you very much for your input. Um, I prefer, yes, uh, Sheikh Hamza would like to I, respond I, to I you. I think, you know, one of the important things that's been brought up here is the problem of just the legitimacy of a government. And, um, you know, in the first Iraqi war, when, when Bush uh, was loath to go into Iraq because he was fearful of creating a political vacuum. Uh, but unfortunately, with the, with the uh, intervention that occurred with Bush II, uh, you know, the, the assumption was we can simply replace a government. But replacing a government is, is obviously, as we all see, is almost impossible. And one of the things about, you know, if you look, w w the, the classical worldview in the, in the Muslim world was much more akin to a Hobbesian worldview, that, uh, you know, you have a, a government and you should maintain the stability of a government. And so scholars, we had, the revolutionary period of Islam was in a very early period, but quickly after that, because of the devastation that these revolutions caused, Muslim scholars basically said that we should obey the ruler, and this was the idea. And this w was maintained for, for a long period of time. And one of the reasons why Muslims were so patient with a lot of the, the tyrannies in the Muslim world was because of this ideology. We've moved into a Lockean period now. 
this idea that um, people have a right to rebel against governments when they're not actually doing what they're, you know, what they're instituted to do, which is first and foremost to protect the, the population and, uh, and also to provide those amenities that enable people to live uh, well. So this is a crisis that we have now and, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, and obviously the, the, the incredible technological changes that have occurred, um, which have also added to the instability, the fact that we're dealing with new technologies that enable people to communicate in ways that they've historically never been able to communicate with. And, and finally, that individuals have the power now to do uh, things that armies had, had the powers to do in the past. One of the things that Brzezinski said uh, recently, which to me was very interesting, he said in the past, you could, uh, it was easier to control a million people than to kill a million people. Today, it's easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. And, and, and for me, that's something that we really have to think about, that one individual, if you look at the beginning of World War I, one individual, Gabrielo Princip, who was a Serbian nationalist, 19 years old, and, and basically he, you know, he did an act that Within a month, uh, Europe was, was in a devastating war. And, and this is where we all should be deeply concerned about the instability in this region where a conflagration could easily uh, erupt because of dirty bombs getting in the hands of these people, something like this. So we're in a very, very serious situation. And Islam, unfortunately, has a militant tradition in, in the same sense, the, the, the samurai, you know, all of these ancient the chivalry of the, of the uh, Middle Ages, that there's a romantic view of violence uh, in, in, in the Islamic tradition. And, and, and the great heroes of Islam were, were great military leaders like warriors. Salahuddin al Ayyubi. They were warriors, but they were chivalrous warriors. Salahuddin was honored in the West. And, uh, uh, but now you're dealing with a perversion of that chivalrous, you know, um, Frost talks about trying to end the wars. He wrote a poem about the League of Nations, and in that he said, they're, these men trying to end war, he said, they're blessed with the acumen to suspect the human trait was not the basest human that made them militate. There's something very noble about courage and, 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 and the warrior and defending the weak, and, and so th this is the mythology that has been created around this, which, which is very problematic. I want to turn to the second hub, which is in Frankfurt, and is coming to us from one of the global shapers in Frankfurt, Susanna Engels. Um, and, and Frankfurt, in Germany, where we see some of the issues that we're discussing here in terms of tolerance, in terms of concerns about rejecting the other, um, really being played out in Germany in uh, a way that I think has captured all of our attentions in Europe and beyond. So Susanna, I'd like to ask you about this issue of, uh, is there a concern about the rise of a rejection of whether it's Muslims or others, we've seen the rise of anti-Semitism also, and how young people can actually face up to that and not allow that to dictate their future? Certainly, thank you, Mina, and guten Tag. Um, I would just maybe, in, in response to that, because the panelists have shared many good views. I'd just like to respond to that and include some of um, their points. So we had a round panel on Saturday with six distinguished panelists of different professional and religious backgrounds. And one of the things we discussed uh, was how the question itself, uh, is religion a pretext for conflict, is, is a bit flawed. Um, we wouldn't, because it almost assumes that it is, or at least it, it puts that forward. We would say religion is not really a pretext per se, but it's, it's often used as a justification for violence. So to say religion is, is, um, is the problem is to oversimplify the issue. So indeed, we do need to look at the broader context, um, as the panelists have already you know, mentioned, so politics, economics, marginalization, exclusion. Um, and a lot of these things are not necessarily brought forth in the media, because commercial mainstream media often portrays uh, you know, just the exceptions and also simplifies the issues so that it's easy for uh, the mainstream matches to understand. Um, I would just like to touch on the point of is religious tolerance intolerance on the rise? And it's a two-way street. We can get religious intolerance from religions towards society and then from society towards religion. And in the first case, I would say that religion is uh, intolerance towards society is not necessarily on the rise, 
but because violence, as uh, Mr. Blair commented, has always been a comment, uh, has always been um, in society. It's been a part of our humanity. However, when media highlights these extreme cases, um, then the more it does that, the more than the masses perhaps believe that religion is the source uh, and, and conflict is growing um, in intolerance. But for example, ISIS has been active for years before media actually brought it to light. Uh, and it media, Susanna, you know, I'm afraid your voice is kind of breaking up. So if you can get closer to the microphone and speak a little slower, we might be able to hear a little more clearly. Is this better now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I was just saying the point of religious intolerance towards society, it's not necessarily on the rise. Violence has always existed, um, as you know, Mr. Blair pointed out, uh, but media highlights these extreme cases. And for example, ISIS had been around and active for years doing these atrocities before media brought it to light. Well, once a Westerner was beheaded, then it became news, and now it's a big deal. Um, so the second, I guess, the other side of that is intolerance from society towards religion. And now this is where I think we're getting into real issues today because the general opinion of mainstream media, at least as I felt as a practicing Catholic and um, as I've just seen in the masses, is that religious people are considered uh, foolish, simple, um, and, and uh, unintelligent. And I, and I think that's a general feeling that we're getting as young people. And I can understand that because there are many religious people who have faith without reason. Mm. It's our duty to have reason with faith and they go hand in hand. So because the general opinion is going in the direction of thinking religious people are you know, simple-minded, the mainstream then provokes us. It, Folks, it by publishing, you know, disrespectful cartoons, for example, and then it becomes more acceptable to make fun of religious people and put them down. Now that's dangerous because those religious people, as we've commented earlier, there's an identity with that. And when you attack an identity, especially of a, especially of a minority, then um, there's there's significant, you know, problems and in conflict that can can result from that. Now I. I'd just like to talk briefly on the point of what we found are potential solutions, and there are two which we agreed upon. One would be integration, um, and a part of that is education, as Mr. Blair pointed out. We can look at example of Denmark. Denmark in 2013 saw 31 people leave the country to go fight as extremists in Iraq and Syria. And what did the country do? They brought them and they said, okay, how can we integrate them? They gave them education and they gave them jobs. And then the following year, only one person left. So I think Mr. Blair is onto something when he says education, jobs, of course, we provide them. And then once we integrate, then we have this belonging feeling and um, that's a potential solution, for example, what France and Germany could look at. Um, and the solution I would suggest is um, one of the reasons I believe that the West is not able to relate well to the Muslim community is because we've also lost our own Christian roots. So if we could go back to that, that might be a basis for us to better communicate and better respect the Muslim community because um, that is something I feel that we've, we've lost, unfortunately. So thank you. Susanna, thank you very much for your input. Um, you've raised some amazing points. One, I think, is the issue that also Archbishop Thabo raised is the issue of freedom of expression and how people's faith is sacred. Truly, the word sacred, I think, is being overused to refer to other things, but for people's religion being sacred and what that means, well, at the same time, nothing can justify violence and surely not something as pure and beautiful as religion can do. I'm her, going to... Well, her point, I think, was very important about identity, that we recognize racial identity and we recognize the fact that people should not be denigrated because of their race. So in public spheres, people cannot use the N-word. In my country, you can't use spick or, or, or mick or kike or any of these words that used to be quite widespread because people recognize that it's not right to den denigrate people. Religious identity for a, a devoutly religious person is far more profound than racial identity. And, and this idea of embracing the denigration of religion, which is something the West relishes because a lot of, of uh, 
you know, the whole modern secular world is an attack on religion. And, but and also I think because people fought hard to be able, in their minds, can, to have You the can freedom. condemn and criticize religion, I think, by all means, have academic conferences on why the Quran is a, a made up book from the Bible and the Torah, uh, write about uh, atheism, why it's preferred, or secularism, all those things are fine, but when you mock, Right. and make fun of people, especially disempowered people, like in France, Moroccans and Algerians uh, that, that are now French. You know, they have a history and they also have an understanding of, of, of growing up in a society that colonized the countries that their uh, fathers and grandfathers were from. And they're in ghettoized situations. 60% of the inhabitants of French prisons are Moroccans and Algerian background and things like this. So the radicalization is very easy to occur when you mock and denigrate. Satire in the West is used against the powerful traditionally. So when you use satire against the powerless, it's not satire anymore. It's just, it's just uh, absolute uh, lack of civility and common decency. But, but, but the other point that I was saying the other point that she's uh, highlighting, uh, which cuts across uh, religion, is the whole notion of fear. Uh, people normally play on people's uh, uh, fear. Um, um, she, she mentioned a statement that um, uh, the, the Muslims may, may fear that they're being attacked uh, by, by the West because uh, extremism is associated uh, with the Muslims. And, and possibly since 9-11, uh, the West will also um, uh, uh, fear that uh, they are being attacked uh, because uh, the extremists that attacked uh, America then were supposed to be, to be Muslims. And uh, perhaps before this, again, this discussion degenerates into a sense of hopelessness and, uh, and us playing on people's fear, we need to underscore the fact that out of roughly six billion population, only a handful are these extremists. And so globally, there are good people wanting the best out of religion and no religion. I just wanted to uh, weave uh, that into this discussion. Excellent. Well, we've now got time for questions. I want to bring in the audience, um, and you've been waiting patiently, so thank you. So if you could raise your hand, please. Um, I believe microphones will come to you, and if you could please identify yourself and make it very brief. Thank you. I've um, got two gentlemen here, so the one just there. Yes, thank you, and then here. My name is Henning Tsiorg, <laughs> Society Culture of Peace. Um, my question belongs to the relation war, violence, and religion. We saw the last year when there was coming up many wars. Um, we have also the problem with the extremists, the terrorists. And one, we have a based uh, economy for resources. And behind the religion, there are also interests. My question goes, of course, to Tony Blair. When you decided to go in the war in Iraq, and we know what happens after Sunni Shiit. There was not this extremist. I think you have to reflect and to give us an answer because I think your decision to go there with Mr. Bush is a part of these problems with the religion. We have Abu Ghraib, we have Guantanamo, Thank you. and so I on. I think the please, idea is clear. My question is, please, can you tell us from the point of view now what was your decision? Because I think we have a great responsibility for the conflicts we have now. Okay. I mean, Thank you. Uh, so you knew this question was gonna come yeah, up yeah, at no, some point. Absolutely, <laughs> and you can have a debate about whether it's the right or the wrong decision. But I'd also point out, and I think many people in Iraq would, that Saddam Hussein wasn't exactly a force for stability, peace, and prosperity for his country and was responsible for killing many, many hundreds of thousands of people. So, look, we can debate this, but what interests me is that there's always a reason. I mean, you're suggesting the extremism all comes from that decision, but then we see the extremism in France that, by the way, was opposed to Iraq, and then it's the cartoons, and then you see what happens in Belgium, what is the reason for that, and then you see what is happening in Nigeria or Central African Republic and Mali. And then you see, by the way, when Gaddafi was removed in Libya, we also now have 
huge instability there. And when we didn't intervene in Syria, we've got probably the worst situation. So my view is you can debate the political decisions, but at some point we've got to understand this extremism has grown up over a long period of time, over decades. Its roots are deep within a perversion of religion, a perversion of the religion of Islam. And I totally agree. Look, if you're sitting in Syria or Iraq today, you need immediate measures, which is why, personally, I support intervention in those situations. And you need immediate relief from the terrorism that is engulfing your life. But let's be very clear about this. Even if we were to defeat those extremist groups there, you've got other extremist groups. And you've got groups now starting in Europe and elsewhere, in Africa, in Central Asia, even in the Far East. And at some point, we've got to deal with the root problem, which is educating people to a closed-minded view of the world that says, if you're not like me, you're my enemy. And we've got to stop making excuses for those people and start to tackle the fundamental incubation of that problem, which lies in formal and informal education systems, educating young people to a culture of hatred to those that are different. And if we don't deal with that, we can debate the political issues forever, but we're never going to get to the root of the problem. Yes, but I think that, uh, Rabbi Rosen's point about the fact that you have communities that completely otherize themselves, like uh, I think the example of the Sufis in Charchamba in Turkey, for instance, you have these Sufis that are very much like the uh, Hasidim in, in Brooklyn. They, they don't read newspapers, they're completely isolated from the dominant community, and yet they're nonviolent um, and, and because they have an understanding of living, they're protected by the state, and, and they're allowed to be uh, completely disengaged. And many religious traditions have this idea. Monks go off to monasteries to get away from the world. So I think that it's not the root problem. I think there's a much deeper root problem here. So if, I, if you will allow me as chair to ask a follow-up question, then we'll come back to the gentleman waiting patiently there. Regarding Iraq, I think what some people would say not to talk about the war and, and Saddam's ills and so forth, because that would be a whole other panel. But to say that when a political system is set up where you are chosen as a political leader because you represent an ethnicity or a sect, and more, more because of a sect, there's almost an encouragement of creating people who will say, I represent the Sunnis, for example, or I represent the Shia, rather than representing citizens and actually weakening the state and making people feel that, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be protected by ex-prime minister or president because they don't represent my group. And that was a system that was put after 2003 in Iraq. So uh, do you actually, reflect no, on that's, that? That's not correct. That was not the system. The system prior to that was a system in which a minority of the country dominated the majority. So let's be very clear about this. The majority in Iraq who were Shia were denied their proper place. That's not so true. That, that, that's, that's just, just true, not true. We there were Shia. Yeah. Look, we can go back and we, I mean, this is a whole other panel, as you rightly say, but no, let, fact, me, let fact, me just make Ba'athists it. Had, the Ba'athists did not, do, in fact, they had Christians. Tariq Aziz was a Christian, mm. one of the most powerful people in Iraq. Yeah. So the yes, Ba'athists the so the were to, not Sunni. I'm going to have to I'm leave sorry. the Iraq dialogue. We, we will follow up afterwards. But I think if you ask the Kurdish people, they might have a rather different view of Saddam Hussein than has just been expressed. But anyway, look, the we, we could... The Ottomans, we, we, the Ottomans yeah, had... Forgive right, me, yeah, we have okay. to go back to the audience. We have to give them <laughs> right. a chance. <laughs> okay, um, the gentleman here. Thank you. And then we have two questions here. So one here and then two over here. I have a question to Sheikh Hansen. If you would be the Prime Minister of Switzerland and the war crime criminal, according to the war criminal... Um, Commission um, of Kuala Lumpur says that Mr. Blair is a war criminal. What would you do if he's entering your country? Would you put him in jail or you would you allow him to come to the World Economic Forum who wants I to improve the state of the world? We can't really go into hypotheticals I'm here. I'm not the prime minister, of, but I wouldn't have outlawed minarets. <laughs> okay, <laughs> two questions here. <laughs> Uh, I'm coming from Turkey, uh, a country of civilizations, a bridge of civilizations. And uh, for the last events, we see that we need uh, 
tolerance uh, to keep up the world peace. So I would like to ask, uh, especially Mr. Blair and the other uh, participants, what do you think about uh, countries like Turkey's position uh, in such a crisis and also the responsibility of the politicians? Okay, and then we'll just take the second question and then you can re respond. I am Madam Mupam from just Nigeria. I'm not sure if Tony Blair went to visit Nigeria. Did you live in Jos or? Right. Well, I am from the north, mm -hmm. the center of Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, and I've lost relations as a result. But I'm telling you, while growing up as a kid or as a child, the religion we see today is, is quite different from the one yeah. my parents practiced. I'm not supposed to be a Adamu as my first name. But it was a great honor for my own Christian father to allow his best Muslim friend to, to name his children. So my brothers, Bia Yakubu, Musa, and uh, I am Adamu. You see, that, that was the atmosphere we all grew up with. And as kids, we look forward to Salah because we knew definitely we we're going to have Christmas uh, Salah food from the Muslim neighborhood who are our friends. And they also look forward to celebrating Christmas with us. That was the atmosphere we grew up. But in, later on in the 80s, we had the Metasini uprising. And subsequently, we had some kind of religious crisis here and there mm -hmm. from tw 2000, uh, 2000, 2001. If you could ask a question, forgive yeah. me. But so my question was, well, I want to associate myself with the argument already presented. We're talking of giving the right education. But I'm telling you, a disease that is much more dangerous than HIV AIDS is poverty. We have to address the issues of people going hungry, people waking up without being sure of a daily bread. Yes. And it's the root cause of all these things we are dealing with in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, well, I'll allow you to answer, I guess, our um, question on Turkey. On Turkey? Yes. I mean, I think Turkey, because it's got the, the, the G20 this year, um, is enormously important because Turkey actually created, along with Spain, the Alliance of Civilizations. And I think it's important both within Turkey and as Turkey presents to the outside world that it should remain a country that is religiously tolerant, uh, respectful of difference, um, and has a, a, a view of how people practice religion in society that is modern. And my view is that that is essentially a view where we accept a common space in our society, where people of different cultures and faiths all share certain common goals. So for me, it's not acceptable to say that my religion says that women should be treated less equally than men. I think treat, equal treatment of men and women is a fundamental right. That's part of the common space. But then when it comes to practicing people's faith, they can practice their faith in different and diverse ways. I just want to make one comment on Nigeria. I mean, I agree particularly in northern Nigeria. You can see the effect of poverty over a long, long period of time. I just want to make this point, though, about the relationship between the politics and religion. Because what's sometimes interesting to me is that I'm, I sit here as the politician and say, well, actually, religion uh, is the issue. And the religious people sit there and say, well, actually, it's the politicians. <laughs> and the truth is, it's both of those things together. But he here's what's really important to recall and remember. In northern Nigeria, if we don't deal with both of those issues, we've got a problem. Because at the same time as it's true that poverty can create a breeding ground for extremism, extreme, extremism it's also the case that if people are being educated to a version of religion that is extreme, that's a problem in tackling poverty and development as well. So the two things I don't think should ever be isolated. They go together. And you need the economic development, the institution building, but the religious dimension is also important because where religion is taught badly, it causes a real problem for the country in getting to grips with its economic development. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Sorry. 
I, I agree. I mean, uh, there's good religion and bad religion. And um, in the case of uh, Nigeria, one needs to pose the question, who is Boko Haram? Who benefits from the presence of Boko Haram? <laughs> Why would a small extremist group be so well armed? Who's arming Boko Haram? So the whole issue of militarization is quite a key, key point that we need to face squarely. But I want to also agree with you. Uh, uh, conflict uh, is as a result of uh, really the need for resources and material and food. And um, it could be addressed in all sorts of, of cloaks. But I just wanted to pose that question that uh, who is our Shabab somewhere? Uh, who is arming Al Shabab? Who is benefiting uh, from a militarized, well armed Al Shabab? Where do they get those sophisticated machinery? In Nigeria? I'll leave that question for you to answer. And another panel to be determined. Um, we're having great conversations, but I want to come back to the audience. There's a gentleman here at the very front who is waiting to ask a question, and then we'll go to the middle. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm Michael Barber. I, um, I should declare that I once worked for Prime Minister Blair um, uh, with, with, with great pleasure. But I'm, I'm here want to talk about education and reinforce the argument, um, uh, really put it to the panel. Um, but first, with a preamble, I've been working with the Chief Minister of Punjab in Pakistan, 100 million people reforming the education system. We've got 2 million extra children in school over the last three years. We're now focused on improving the learning outcomes. He is a devout Muslim leader building an effective state that can deliver the kind of education that Prime Minister Blair talked about. Um, and the point I want to put to the panel is effective state building goes with the long-term education agenda, mm -hmm. but we're never going to fix these problems without much improved education. OK, thank you very much. OK, there's two ladies here. We'll take them, and then I'll come back at the yeah. second round. OK, just two over here. Hi, my name is Sintan Bilhoff. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a writer, uh, mostly, and an editor. Um, and I actually, I'm, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Uh, I've, uh, I've read a lot about it uh, constantly, obviously. Um, and I've been thinking about it on a more, perhaps, abstract level in the sense that uh, I've been wondering whether it's more of less of a, an attack on the freedom of expression and perhaps more of an attack on the um, concept of laïcité in France, so of the secular state. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that on a religious and on a political level. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. And the lady just behind you, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Fatima. I'm actually a global shaper representing the Musket Hub in Oman. Hi, Aman, Frankfurt, Toronto, and Erbil. So um, while I applaud the forum for their initiative, bringing people of differing opinions on the same stage and having a dialogue about it. I think what's more important is that actions speak louder than words. So my question for all four of you is that, what do you plan to do once you get back to your res respective destinations with all the talk that you've been doing this week regarding religion and conflict once you get back? What do you plan to do on the ground with what you have just discussed this week? Okay. Great. Okay, hold those thoughts. I'm just going to bring in the Toronto Hub, since we are now speaking to the shapers. I'm going to bring the Toronto Hub, and then please hang on to those questions and, and give them answers. So um, Toronto is represented by Matthew, Tom Matthew Thomas, if I'm right. Um, and it's, he's a global shaper. So thank you for patiently waiting with us. And we'd like to hear about integration, really, and Canada as an example of both people from different walks of life living together, but also the issue of religion and how it's been tackled there. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great question. And we've started to touch on a few things around freedom of religion. And I think your faith cooperation is a very key aspect of Canadian society. When we think of top to bottom here in Canada, it's a very special place for religiously motivated cooperation as opposed to conflict. And there's multiple drivers of that. 
One of the most important in Canada and Toronto, though, is that we have a relatively high regard for freedom of expression and freedom of religion. These freedoms matter quite a bit to us. We try and our charter. Sir, you have to forgive me. Your voice is breaking up. So we, we heard you well until freedom of religion and freedom of expression, but we've lost you. And as a result, they give us good discipline for what we need. These rights, while they're very easy to take for granted here in Canada, they're a fundamental precondition to the amazing sense of pluralism that we have in Canada. And it acts as a driver for interfaith cooperation. As a quick example of how that plays out here, uh, last year the provincial government in Quebec recently proposed a law that would ban the wearing of conspicuous religious symbols in public institutions and to act as public services. And then last year the, the Quebec electorate overwhelmingly re rejected not just the proposed bill, but the party that tabled it in the first place. And so these laws and these rights, they actually set a culture where fear, fear of others, fear of losing our own self-identity, is not a driver of our politics, and it's not a driver of our laws and our lives. Instead, we have the confidence to invite others into our homes of different faiths. We believe you can give someone else a right without necessarily having to sacrifice your own. A really important point, though, is while that's at the highest levels, the beauty of cooperation in Canada is it happens at the very local levels, too. I'm really so sorry, because be we're really interested to hear the rest of what you're telling us, but we can't hear it well. So um, let's give it one more try, and then unfortunately we might have to wrap it up. But try to speak slower and closer to the microphone, please. Household as well. No, that didn't work. <laughs> I think we're having a time delay. Um, but I think that the issues you raised, of course, about laws and the discussions that laws, when whether they're accepted or rejected, allow between people. I'm really sorry we didn't get to hear the rest of what you had to tell us. Um, if you want to give it one more try, and then otherwise we'll call it a day. Sure. C can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> OK. So we explored interfaith cooperation at the local level here at an event two days ago with 50 interfaith leaders across the city, many faiths, many different aspects of the greater Toronto area represented. It's a city of very diverse proportions. At the city level, we looked at cases of how over 250 faith leaders came together across faiths to actually lobby against a proposed casino here in Toronto. The faith leaders remarked that it's never been done at that scale before, and that's how faith leaders have come together to cooperate uh, on the city built level. We also looked at it from an environmental and a neighborhood level, and in particular, how faith communities are coming together to prepare disaster resilient action plans in the face of extreme weather. So, you know, here in Toronto, we're, we're freezing, we have ice storms, uh, but disaster resilience plans at the neighborhood level are very applicable for hurricanes, for earthquakes, and tsunamis. And faith leaders often come together to lead the neighborhoods that can save lives in those first few days when first, first responders are there. And one of the more fun aspects of the evening as well was looking at interfaith cooperation in the household, and particularly with families. We had uh, a gentleman named Colin Boyd Schaefer who's putting together a photography and documentary project called the Interlove Project. He's telling the stories of over a hundred interfaith couples and how their common differences, uh, sorry, their commonalities have brought them together. We had a great quote. One couple told us that we were reminded of our humanity when we married into each other's faiths. And what they meant by saying that was how when actually understanding each other's faith, they found the real commonality was love and compassion. The last theme that was really discussed was around the next generation, both Generation Y, which our Shaper community is part of, myself included, and Generation Z, the folks that are uh, toddlers today. We're growing up in a very different environment where intuitively we understand the complexity and the intersection of these faiths. And in Toronto, there are many shared spaces of faiths and worship. For example, uh, one example came up where uh, in one plot there's a mosque and a synagogue. And while the adults and parents go to the mosque and the synagogue, their children actually congregate in the parking lot, the shared parking lot together. And that's how they're thinking about interfaith cooperation. I think one of the best quotes of the evening was that the ideal interfaith environment is one where it doesn't even matter. What we really care about are your ideas and your thoughts as people, not your labels. And so that's where I think young people can really come and lead the way, hand in hand with folks who have been doing this for many, many generations and decades. 
we have a different view on this. And in particular, I think we can try to have a more strengths-based, asset-based approach to interfaith cooperation, and of course, apply those insights by building up at the ground level, uh, moving up to the global level. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think the very good point made about local partnerships and, and people having shared interests when they're living in the same neighborhood and actually want to make it a better place, if only we could replicate that in more parts of the world where we have more in common in trying to create a better circumstances for ourselves, for our families, than trying to destroy the other and in that destroy ourselves. Okay, so let's take the, the couple of questions that we had and then I'll take a final round. I've got two questions there, but first we'll just get your responses. What are you going to do when you go home to make this conversation a reality rather than just words, but also to discuss the issue of an attack on a secular state? Well, I mean, I, I'm involved in a liberal arts Muslim college and part of the reason for that is that it was said earlier that, that these people were highly educated um, that perpetrated 9-11, but the truth is they, they weren't educated in the humanities, they weren't educated in, um, in what was traditionally in the Muslim world considered to be a, a sine qua non of an Islamic education. Poetry was actually a prerequisite for interpreting the Quran. Uh, the, the Ottomans used uh, Jalal ad-Din Rumi's um, great Masnawi as, as a foundational text in their madrasa system, which taught religious tolerance. Uh, we've lost a metaphysical tradition. When religion loses metaphysics, it loses the ability to defend itself intellectually, and so its defense becomes one of violence. Uh, when, when people don't have spokespeople that can articulate their highest truths with intelligence, uh, they're reduced to finding people to defend their religion that uh, use brute force. So that's, that's what I'm involved in. I'm also involved in teaching grammar in a prison um, to, you know, one of, the, one of the dangers is there's a high level of conversion in our prisons and it's very easy for the criminal class. And one of the things that is noted with a lot of these Westerners who have gone to um, the Middle East to fight, they actually came out of criminal class uh, elements and they get converted in prisons. And, and, and so suddenly the, the, the criminal uh, background that they have is is now uh, given a veneer of religion, and it's you know they say that evil people can do evil things, uh, but but only good people do evil things with religion, mm. right? So it's a, it's a very dangerous um, situation. So that that's what I'm involved in in education, and I do believe education in terms of dealing with the religious problem is absolutely accurate. I'm I'm not denying that, but I think that religion is being enlisted in this violent struggle for other reasons. There are deeper reasons, there are deeper issues going on. The, the Muslim world has some of the highest levels of un unemployment. The unemployment in Jordan is much worse than it was in America during the Great Depression. You know, pe people forget that people don't have um, basic uh, needs. They can't, in Egypt, young men can't, can't even think of marriage, mm -hmm. of getting married. So suddenly going and getting a concubine in, uh, in Iraq sounds like a pretty good deal. Thank you. Archbishop Trump. Yeah, yeah, yes, for me, um, I'm involved, um, besides being an archbishop, with the interreligious uh, group uh, in the country called the Western Cape Religious Leaders Forum uh, as its patron. And uh, when I go home, I will once again go and remind uh, the group and ourselves of the critical uh, value of love, because all religions talk about love. And, uh, but when we fight, we, we forget about that uh, critical value. But also in speaking about love, I would not use it as uh, a appeal to do away with the contextual challenges that people in our country face, the inequality of opportunity, uh, the inequality uh, in terms of material, the, the, the longing and the vision that uh, uh, most of uh, our people uh, in Southern Africa uh, uh, have. So that's one practical aspect. Uh, do either one of you who have already spoken want to talk about the, respond to the question that came about France? 
can you respond to that or if I can, I don't want to forget one of I our think, questions. Well, I think it's a really important question and, and uh, Olivier Ra deals with that in his book on Islam and secularism. I think he deals with it uh, quite deeply and very well and certainly France has an idea of itself. I, I, mean, I don't want to essentialize France or speak on behalf of French people, but you know, the, the idea of liberty is, is actually foundational and the, the laïcité à la France uh, Francais is, is, a, is a unique form of European secularism, which is very different from, say, the secularism in England, which acknowledges faith. Um, it, it's the idea of removing faith from the public space, and, and, and that's why we have to be careful about uh, essentializing secularism, because there are many different versions of secularism, and I think Islam is quite compatible with many of the versions, but with French secularism, it's difficult for Muslims, definitely. Uh, and in terms of that, perhaps I will pose a question to South Africans. What does it mean I am a Charlie? And what does it mean I am not a Charlie? Does, um, uh, and what is missing in terms of their personal uh, treatment of that which is different? Uh, what is their understanding of the issues uh, uh, um, in France? But of course, as a person of, of faith, I can't um, abandon hope, uh, I will actually say, in that messiness, uh, in the killing, in the unfortunate circumstances that have happened uh, in France, of, of course, one has to condemn uh, any form of terrorism. You can't be uh, tolerant of, of terrorism, uh, but I, I would like to push people uh, beyond buzzwords, beyond uh, just throwing sentences into going down deep into what are the real uh, causes um, of uh, what happened uh, in France. Thank you. Rabbi Rene. So f fortunately, I, I, at least I'm protected, if you like, or uh, I'm blessed in that I can respond to your question in terms of what takes up most of my time. In other words, I'm employed to build bridges between different religious communities. That's my life work. Um, in fact, I'm employed by AJC, one of the oldest American Jewish, ad Jewish advocacy organizations, to in effect be ambassador for Judaism to the religions of the world. So I'm about half of the time <laughs> traveling around the world than I am back at home. And that is part of what I was trying to emphasize before, the importance not only of counteracting prejudice and bigotry, something I learned from my South African experience, and therefore to be able to be understood correctly, and to be able to be represented correctly, but to be able to understand others and to be able to represent others correctly. And the importance then of building these bridges, that is my passion, that's what my life is committed to. And when I'm back home, living in Jerusalem, in Israel and Palestine, that's what I try to dedicate myself to. And I'm proud to have founded an interreligious coordinating council in Israel, which brings together over 70 organizations working in interfaith relations one way or another. We founded a council of religious institutions in the Holy Land, which brings together Palestinian leadership and Israeli leadership. And Mr. Blair has met with this particular leadership. That's both of the Sharia courts of the Palestinian Authority and the Ministry of Al-Qaf, the chief rabbi of Israel, and all of the patriarchates. There are enormous amount of endeavors, which of course you don't read in the press because that doesn't sell new newspapers or get a rating in terms of TV, enormous positive endeavors. And I'm also a founder of an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights, which works primarily in terms of Palestinian human rights. When I've been criticized, I've hardly ever been criticized because I care about Palestinian human rights. I've often been bitterly criticized because I work together with reform rabbis, which for Orthodox colleagues is considered a very <laughs> serious sin. But, uh, what that also dovetails is the importance that religious interfaith activity is not detached from the human rights issue. This is a critical and important marriage of enormous significance, precisely as you say, to be able to show what you're doing on the ground as it affects people. Uh, I'm not sure to what degree religion can impact on politics. Some places it can, some places it can't. As I said right at the beginning, there's no cookie cutter. Religion isn't exactly the same thing in one context to another. But there are certainly plenty we can do, even if we can't transform that political reality, and that's our obligation to do so. Thank the, you. I'm sorry. I'm going oh, you don't to want to me to respond to the lie, City? I, I, I forgive me, but we have a very patient gentleman waiting in Jordan who's sat through an hour and 40 minutes, very patient. So I'm going to have to come to him. But first, of course, I don't want to take um, just 
30 seconds quickly, what you're going to try to do to take this conversation further, Mr. Blair. Uh, to continue doing what we're doing with the, the foundation I established, which is about religious respect between people of different faiths. We have a schools program that links up schools across the world, for example, schools in Indonesia with those in India, UK and Egypt, Jordan, America. And two things we learn out of that. The first is the more that people know about the other, the more likely they are to respect the other. And the second thing is that the more they interact with people of a different faith, the more, strangely enough, they understand their own. Thank you. Well, I go to our fourth hub, seconds. which is in Amman, Jordan, um, with Mr. Omar Razaz, who's chairman of the Jordan Strategy Forum. And as is very representative of Jordan, he has shown much patience. Um, and I'd like to hear from you. Um, uh, Jordan, of course, is in a, in a difficult position, as many of the countries of the region are. I'd like to hear from you on this issue of a tolerance, but also if you can touch upon the impact that what happens in Palestine has on the rest of the region, if not the world, perhaps also the world, um, in terms of many of the dis representations of despair and anger that we see. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, it's been a very interesting morning. Uh, we've had the global shapers, uh, a lot of youth here, uh, discuss the issue at hand, and we've listened very intensely to what was the deliberation we've had. Uh, there is a sense of trauma that uh, we are facing, and there is a, a real danger that the trauma of the Middle East, of the region, and its ramifications in the West can take us down a very dangerous uh, trajectory. You've asked about tolerance. Um, uh, we've, there's agreement that religion and Islam can be hijacked. And the, the sad irony is that uh, Quran itself uh, addressing the Prophet Muhammad when Prophet Muhammad was being abused and ridiculed uh, by the non-believers, the Quran talks about his sadness, not his anger. Uh, and, and about how his sadness can be dealt with. And in another place, the Quran tells the believers that if you are sitting in a group that is ridiculing Islam uh, and, and the Quran, what you need to do is to leave until the topic changes, and then you go back uh, to, to them. So it's, there is a huge difference between what we've learned and what we've read and, and what we see uh, interact. Um, on the ground um, through this uh, hijacking. You, uh, your question about the ram how, you know, we live in breeding grounds of this extreme um, version. And these breeding grounds have been put together through socioeconomic and political factors that have played themselves out over years and years. Some of them are internal. Some of them have to do with certain interpretations of Islam, but some of them are the result of the trauma that the region has suffered over the years, partly internal, partly regional, and partly international uh, forces. Um, a number of the panelists talked about youth. Um, in our part of the world, there is a new term that literature uses. It's, a, it's, it's the weighthood generation. This is a whole generation in waithood. Uh, they, they finish high school or finish university. They can't find a job. They can't find a job. They can't find a house. They can't find a house. They can't get married. They can't make, get married. And you can just imagine the amount of frustration, economic frustration, but also political frustration reflected in the inability to participate in anything political that is legitimate. Anything political is almost illegitimate in, in, in countries. And the irony is that we, you know, the world speak at, at both ends of its mouth on these issues. We, there is support of uh, historical support of despotic regimes in the region, while at the same time decrying some of the outcomes of, uh, of what happens. Um, I, I know we're running out of time, but I want to say education is very important. But how can you educate uh, students if they are not allowed to ask questions, if they're not allowed to probe 
political, social, economic, and religious realities that they face. There is no such thing as education the way we understand it if it is not coupled with um, a reform that turns the state into a civic state for all its citizens. In the absence of that, what we will be stuck with is e either supranational ideologies or subnational ideologies and, and identities, uh, which either of which uh, leads to uh, tremendous conflict. I want to end with, um, you know, we're all reminded, unfortunately, with Sam Huntington's, uh, uh, you know, uh, clash of civilizations. And we, many of us have, have been talking about the fact that it's not a clash of civilizations, it's been a clash of fundamentalisms, various forms of fundamentalism. And the only way we can get out of the dangerous track we have, we're on to now, is really an empowered alliance of civilizations, a real alliance of civilizations. But that would require for us to be consistent, consistent when we talk about freedom, consistent when we talk about freedom of speech, consistent when we condemn terrorism, we also condemn separation walls, we also condemn uh, uh, grabbing of land, illegal settlements, and consistent about drones that kill civilian population. It is very hard for our part of the world to be convinced uh, about the superiority of freedoms and human, human rights when we see that outrage is being exercised um, very selectively. We want to be outraged together at what happened in Charlie Heb uh, Hebdo and at what happens everywhere in the Middle East and around the world whenever we see such atrocities committed against human beings anywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, uh, profound, yes, thank you. <laughs> so unfortunately, we have less than five minutes to wrap up. So I apologize to those in the audience who did not get a chance to ask a question. I do apologize, but I thought it was important to give our panelists the time to answer the questions as best as they can. Um, so by wrapping up, um, I, I want to, I guess, pose the final thought that the fear and identity were two words that were brought up quite a lot. And in different parts of the world, regardless of uh, the political dynamics, there is more a sense of fear, and maybe because we hear things much quicker now and through different platforms with 24-hour news cycles, but also we see more wars and, and conflicts that are between people within even the same country or within the same city. So how can we use religion to diffuse these tensions rather than actually be the fuel that is fueling some of these conflicts? Easy question to wrap up. <laughs> um, Please. What I learned in the Northern Ireland peace process was very simple, that you had to not just engage the politicians, but you also had to engage civic society, and you had to engage because people were abusing religion in that context, you had to engage the religious leadership. And the best way of, of showing that you're against the abuse of religion, when you identify yourself as one type of religion, say everyone who doesn't agree with me is, is my enemy, the best way of demonstrating the opposite is for people of different faiths to come together. And this is why the whole question of interfaith dialogue is so important and so fundamental. And it's absolutely right, as the colleague from Jordan was just saying, by the way, that if you're going to educate young people, they've got to be able to ask the questions. And that's why I say the more that people know about the other, the more that they see people who are different coming together, working together, living together, learning from each other, the less likely you, you are to have conflict. So the question is, and this is, as I say, it's strange for me as a political leader to be saying this, we actually, as political leaders, can't solve these problems on our own. You know, we need the religious leadership to be standing out there and saying, we're reaching across the faith divide, we're sitting down with people who are different, and we're working together. And by that demonstration, we are showing, by the way, not just that people of different faiths can live together, but also that people of different faiths and no faith 
can live together? And that is the true answer to these questions about secular versus religious. Faith has a right to speak. Faith does not have a right to dominate. In the end, the only societies that work nowadays are ones that are pluralist, ones that accept difference, celebrate it as a strength, and make sure that society as a whole allows people to practice their faith, whatever that faith may be, but in a common space of shared values that are about liberty and freedom and the ability of people to express themselves and live themselves as they choose. Thank you. Well. Bye-bye, David. <laughs> Okay, so let's agree we're going to do one round of applause at the very end, because I'm running out of seconds well, at this point. I'm going to save you at least <laughs> part of the time by agreeing 101% with Tony Blair, and I can then pass over and now my colleagues <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great speech, by the way. <laughs> I also want to reiterate that uh, freedom and mutual respect are key values that are enshrined within our sacred text, and if we really uh, uphold those, uh, we will be able to transcend all the differences. But, and also repeats my earlier statement that out of the six billion uh, uh, population members, only a handful uh, could be said to be terrorists. So let's not be overwhelmed by just this uh, few. Um, one of the tricky aspects of Arabic is the word for right is also the word for responsibility. So the Arabs understood that there are two sides of one coin. Freedom of speech is a right, but it also has responsibilities that go with it. Um, my own teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya, argues that, you know, that we have to spread peace. And this was one of the essential messages of the Prophet Muhammad. He became, as Karen Armstrong points out, a peacemaker, trying to stop the violence that was widespread in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. And he, he argues that within the context of peace, we can redress wrongs more effectively and with greater hope than the context of war, the outcome of which is never known. But like Kennedy or Ted Sorsen, whoever wrote his speech, said mm. that um, you know, if, we, if we make uh, peaceful revolution impossible, we make violent revolution inevitable. And I think that, that this is what happened with the Arab Spring. There was a lot of hope, but all of this was, was really made impossible. And so we're seeing, unfortunately, the attempts to change the conditions um, through violence, which is uh, a disaster. Thank you. Well, um, before I thank our panelists, I want to leave you with one thought that I often think of, which is a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He said, khayrun nas man nafa'an nas, which is the best people are those who benefit people. He didn't say benefits Muslims. And so I think for us, especially being here at the World Economic Forum, I'm part of the Open Forum, is thinking how we can help others through some difficult times. I'd like to very much thank the Global Shapers for um, putting together much of this um, session today and for their participation. I'd like to thank our panelists, and I'd like to thank you very much for your coming and joining us today. <laughs> <laughs>